Hey, this is Vicki Abelson and it's Game Changers. And my guest tonight is Keaton Simons all the way from Nashville. Hey. Mwah. I love you so much. I love you so much. I am so happy that you're here. Me too. And I'm so, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. And it, you know, these days, it doesn't matter if you're in Nashville, if you're in LA, it doesn't matter where you are because it's all the same, right? Yeah, we're pretty much all in our living room. <laughs> That's right. Where, wherever it may be. It's the it's truth. The living room. It's, yes. It's crazy. So, so before we get, I'm waiting for the COVID crazies to show up before, yes, I, start that's, that's asking, all good. before I start asking you the COVID questions. The um, Coco COVID crazies. We have, we have, yeah, with maybe you can write us a theme song. We're going to talk about our <laughs> songs. We're going to talk about the fact that you've scored your first major motion picture, which I'm yes. So Oh my God, we, we're going to talk about that when, when more people have joined us because that's of course, too, of course. too exciting for words. <laughs> I'm so thrilled for you. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, me too. That's like dream come true status. You know, I hope I get to keep doing that for a while. It's that is fun. We're going to talk about how that came to be. Of um, course. And, and all right. So, hey, okay. So, so the COVID crazies are here. I, I just want to say, uh, Keaton, that when I look to the right, I'm yeah. not, I'm not dissing you. What I'm doing is- I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't feel dissed, it's all right. <laughs> I'm looking at the people who are with us. So Good. that I, because we'll, I'll take questions from them because you have a lot of fans. Perfect, and, I can't see them. So I don't, I, 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 if I look to the right, I just see my dining room table. I, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, all right, so t first, first let's start with the beginning. So why did you, why'd you move to Nashville, Keaton? I, I moved to Nashville because I started playing lead guitar with my friend Brett Young. I'm wearing the sweatshirt right now. This is like my favorite sweatshirt also. But my my brother who I've known and been friends with for a long, long time was a big part of the Southern California singer songwriter scene for a long time. He moved to Nashville years ago, hit it huge, became a huge star. Now he's had six consecutive number one hits. He's only ever released singles that have gone number one. Oh and a couple, God. yeah, a couple of years ago, they were in need of a new lead guitar player. I nominated myself and, uh, and it worked out. And it's, it, this is the family. Like we just, I mean, I, I, I can't believe how, how fortunate I am to be a part of this amazing, amazing crew and band and community. It's just, it's great. All right, I have the first question. Is that an electric yeah. violin, uh, mandolin in the behind you? <clears throat> it is, it is just a regular mandolin. I don't think okay. it has pickups in it, no. All right, so an acoustic mandolin. It's an acoustic mandolin, a regular, regular, <laughs> regular, and yeah. So, so yeah. okay. So, how did you guys meet? How did you meet Brett? How did how did that relationship? Uh, start? Well, I first met Brett in in L.A. Uh, right. probably thirteen something years ago or so, and he, I mean, he's recorded stuff in my old studio, my old house in the Valley, like before I even moved to Venice and stuff. I mean, wow. we've known each other for a long time, and. His musical director, Noah Needleman, mm -hmm. is the one who I brought in and partnered with for the, the film score for Love Weddings and Other Disasters. Because oh. I'm like, this is the family. Let's do it. And it was it was amazing. We were able to weave it all in and very cool. Isn't that the way it happens, though? You know, yeah. I, I think, uh, what's the word? Nepotism? I mean, nepotism yeah. is alive and well for a reason. It's because when we, well, yeah. when we feel comfortable with people, when we're drawn to people, I think it reflects in the work that for sure right that level of ease and we, definitely and also it's a part of a, a lot of our fantasies to bring our friends along with us you know we all know that we're surrounded by extremely talented people no one of us could can say well you know i deserve it more than any of the rest of these people that's just not true we all know that everyone's so super talented so if, if the pieces happen to fall into the right place for somebody and they're open and, and inclusive and bring the people they love and respect along with them i think it just strengthens everybody it's proven too. too in this case yeah I do too. I mean, I, I you know, I, I used to be, a, I used to direct theater and, and, yeah. um, and act in theater, but when I would direct, there's, there's a shorthand with people that, you know, and, Absolutely. you know, I, I, I actually, I, I cast this one guy in a leading role. Of, he was in um, uh, Fast Times at Richmond High. He's a great actor, yeah. but he just couldn't get this character and he didn't understand what I was trying to tell him. It just got too frustrating. And, and I, okay, bring in my friend from LA, please. Right, and, exactly. Uh, 
And that's what ended up happening. So yeah. there's a lot of nepotism in your life, which we're going to get. I mean, not nepotism, but there's a lot. No, of, no, no. The, yeah. yeah. Family and in the biz with the family. But, you know, it's, it's a double edged sword, believe me, with the nepotism, because the thing is, there, there's also the full stigma about it when somebody when you're close to somebody and right. they say, here, listen to this person who I really care about and love and is very important to me. That's a lot of pressure to put on somebody They're They're suddenly in a position where they go, well, now, if I don't like it, can I say that? How do I <laughs> say it? Can I not like it? Can I like it? I mean, where do, you know, like suddenly you don't even know how you feel about it. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that I've been able to back up the nepotism with, with, real work and wow. and so it's been great but i mean i'm sure there have been some people who have gotten my my music uh from somebody and maybe it's not their favorite thing in the world and they might have felt uncomfortable in that situation i don't want that that's not conducive to getting things uh, done you know right right no absolutely all right Bef but, so i have like 15 more questions sure. like, at, on the tip of my tongue but i see a couple questions so i'm just going to ask them even though it's not where we are in the conversation, but That's a big jump wants around. to know what your first instrument was. My first instrument was the piano. Oh, yeah. So now I would not have known that. Yeah. Were you my like kids taking piano. piano lessons when, you know, is that? My mom, my mom is a great piano player and she, she learned either. when she was younger and, uh, and she would just play. We always had a piano from the time I was really young and she would play and I was able to I was kind of a prodigy when I was a kid I was able to play whatever I saw her play from the time I was really really young what? and that's that's how I got started in all of it that's how we knew that I had a you know real musical ability okay I've never seen you play piano is it something that you still oh. do yeah a lot you on a lot of records on a lot of my recordings I'm playing everything that yeah, I, I guess yeah. I didn't know that. I sure. guess I didn't know that. Okay. Um, and then somebody asks, uh, let's see, um, of all the artists that you've worked with, do you have a that's like who's your favorite kid? Harry. No, I'm I kidding. I know, right? Yeah. I, you know, like so is are there a few artists that stand out for you? And we'll get that's to all stuff. of them later. Of course. I mean, listen, there there I I've worked with some of the most incredible artists, and of course, each one of us have a completely unique and rich relationship uh right. but my time with chris cornell especially considering his life was so cut so short and all of that is just it's just a huge monumental thing and part of my life it's something i get to talk about a lot and i think about a lot and i see his family his kids are super talented and they're all posting stuff with them singing and it's amazing i love all that stuff uh i still you know, on a regular basis, get people calling and texting me saying, I was listening to satellite radio. I was watching this thing. I was at a friend's house and I saw this and then he said your name and all this. And like, it's, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. And I wish he was here so I could thank him and hug him and squeeze him. I love that man so much. Well, let's, talk, really about work close. let's talk about him a little bit. How, how did that yeah. relationship start, Keaton? Well, that was it. That was kind of a nepotistic thing too. You know, okay. uh, Eric was working on, on a video, music and video of his. And when you say Eric, we have oh, my stepdad. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm talking because we know each other. We're friends. Right. I, I'm that. assuming everybody knows, but not everybody knows that Eric. Right. Roberts yes, Eric Roberts, Roberts, my stepdad. He was in yeah. in a. He's been in a lot of really killer music videos, and for a while in the mid uh, 2000s, he was in a string of music videos that all went to number one. Every what? song was like five Is in a row. True? Oh yeah, I mean, it was Mr. Brightside. Uh, you know, the killers, Mr. Brightside. There was uh, uh, what's her name, Mariah Carey. There was an Akon video. It was uh, uh, Rihanna. I mean, it was like all this one after another after another. It was so many. Uh, but anyway, so he was in the video with Chris, and he they were talking about uh, Chris's son was in the video too. So mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, my kid is a musician too. You know, he loves your music here. Take this, listen to it and see that. And then next thing I know, Chris is hitting me up on Twitter and he's like, Hey man, I've been like listening to your stuff and really dig it. And, and, and I said, I will do anything for you. Let's do this. <laughs> you know, he's like, and then, then they asked, uh, he asked if I would play with him, you know, and, and join the band for a little while on that solo run. You know, I have to say that the loyalty and the Eric 
loves you so much. Uh, it's incredible. So it is amazing. Huge props. But this is not where it started with you guys. And we're going to go back. We're, we're going to mm. go back in, in that a little bit too, because that's definitely. The, you have a lot of, you have so many amazing stories. All right, I'm going to keep going with the questions. You have a couple of, mm -hmm. of friends here that are saying, Lindsay Lassen says he felt, so, is Lindsay a girl or a guy? Lindsay Lassen me. said uh, they felt so bad when you were at their house and the piano didn't, was out of tune. Oh, <laughs> no, I was, um, that was fine. But this piano is out of tune also. I think pretty much every piano is out of tune. Um, <laughs> Unless it's in a studio that's like, you know, actively being being used every day. But uh, that's completely fine. Out of tune pianos are charming. And Kara, I remember playing that, of course. Yes. You do? Okay. And Kara yeah. Goldman says that, hi, Keaton, Eliza just called me to let me know you're on. So Kara. Oh, good. <laughs> well, hello. Okay. So, so we're doing all of that. And and the, the, the guy who asked about who your favorite uh, artists to work with were said he was thinking of Chris Cornell. So he's so glad that you yeah. thought about it. And, I can uh, imagine. Uh, okay. So I, I don't even know where to start. I have, I have too many questions for you. I'm going to start here. Yeah. All we're right. Going to we're COVID crazy. My my people. Yes, we are you guys COVID. are the COVID crazies. By the way, I had I got the vaccine yesterday. I and saw that online. It's great. Yeah, Good six hours in my car at Dodger uh, Stadium. But you know that's, what? That's not the we're, most fun. But it's, of course, it's worth it. Are you kidding? Okay. It's been a year of us waiting for in the house for something. Okay, to so happen. what is it? What is it? Has it looked like for you guys? You live with it's your been, girlfriend, yes. Yes, yes, yes. We're yes, we're we live here together, and um, and uh, it's been like listen, the whole this whole crew because we were right in the middle of of like heavy touring, new record, brand new tour. We uh, with Brett Young and you know, the, the movie thing was already happening. I filmed it in October. I'm in the movie as well. So Okay, so somebody just said, Keaton, something. you're so talented and you have such a great look. Do you act? Mm. That was one of the uh, other questions. Okay. I kind of act. I Usually I get cast as myself. That's so right. I don't really have a chance to act, but but it's, I, I love, I just like doing things that are fun and creative and artistic. But anyway, we Wait, were and, and right- in this film, are you doing yourself or are you acting in a role? Well, I'm essentially playing myself. Okay. You know, I'm playing I'm playing a guitar playing singing guy on the street, you know. Okay. So it's like yeah. it's not me technically, but it's right. you know, uh, plus I wrote all the stuff. <laughs> I created all the music stuff. So. Um, but anyway, we like Brett and this whole team and this whole crew, we've all been really determined just to stay positive, contribute to and increase the positivity overall, approach all of this from a, a, a point of view of acceptance, just say this is reality right now, resisting it is pointless. And so we're just gonna make the very best of, of it that we possibly can. We've done some really cool online streaming stuff. I've done some a ton of solo stuff. Of course, the stuff with the movie, lots of placements. I've got songs in uh, you know new shows like Cobra Kai and, wow. and all kinds of things like that. Um, tons of, of just composing and creating. I have a lot of material just brand new, just playing with new ideas and new kinds of things different instruments. I started playing harmonica. I mean, it's like, you know, just cooking, focusing on making amazing food, learning about things, taking this time saying, you know, I don't know that I'm going to have another year off maybe ever in the, my life. You know what I mean? So, and right, we, were right right. About, we, we deferred up over 150 shows in this time. That's, I mean, shows at arenas and stadiums, like not like a show at a coffee shop, like, Oh my arenas. God, oh my God. Millions oh, of people and hundreds of millions of dollars. And you know what I mean? Like just a huge difference and a huge shift. We were in Europe about to play the O2, two days away from playing the O2 and got sent home in an emergency, you know? So it's it's been crazy, it's been weird. And, and uh, but, but give us, give us a little so determined to make the best of it. First of all, I'm really, imp I'm so impressed that you are doing so much. You know, I've gone well, live every day and that's something, but I haven't touched my screen. I can tell you all the things I haven't right. done, but then right. I have, to, wait a minute, I've gone live every day. That, that has just to that's be a huge. Perfect, right? So, yeah, of course. So, 
but Keaton, the fact that you've learned a new instrument and you're doing all this recording yeah. and you're placing stuff and you're doing all this, but what, how, how does your day-to-day -day look? Um, um, do, you go, do you go to stores? Yeah. What, what is your code? No, what? no, I do. I've, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I kind of got hip to the uh, extreme isolation and the hermit lifestyle before it yeah. became COVID responsible. I, I've, I've, I've loved to, I've been ordering groceries from like Instacart and Amazon Fresh and stuff like that for years now. Oh. I haven't gone to a grocery store in years. Yeah. Like probably five years or something, maybe four, four years. Um, so I've been doing that forever anyway, and it's wonderful and perfect. It's so easy. Uh, and then, you know, m m most of the wait stuff- Wait a minute, why did, you, the wait, why did you start doing it all those years ago? Because I, I don't really dig going, I don't like the fluorescent lights. And the, as soon as I go, get in there, I feel really tired and stuff. And I like the, oh. it, to me, it makes so much sense to have that be a part of like a delivery thing. Because I also don't really, like I, I cook everything, we cook everything here uh, from scratch and, and you know, nothing like packaged and all that. So it's, it's just easy to get, rather than ordering food for delivery from a restaurant, right. ordering groceries for delivery and then making the food. Are you also vegan? Uh, no, but I, but I eat and cook vegan a lot. Like mostly, oh. most food products are vegan. <laughs> all all fruits and vegetables and grains and you know all that kind of stuff so and I end up cooking mostly vegan but I do make a lot of pizza and calzones and stuff like that and I I use cheese for that okay so well you're human so <laughs> what does it look like in terms of who is in do you have other people in your bubble besides your girlfriend I know you're uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah we got Yep. Yep. My mom, I mean, here's the thing I've since I've kind of only done, um, sp specific things like one-offs for, for major companies and big exposure stuff. Like everything I've done with Brett, we've had m millions of eyes on, like we did one thing for Pepsi. We did a thing for camping wow. world that had a million and a half views. It's like crazy, wow. you know, huge stuff. So they have a responsibility to be extremely cautious. Everyone was tested ahead of time, tested on site, uh, you know, kept in, in, in very specific circumstances. And we right. all just want to contribute to, to making, helping this thing to go away sooner. So the good news is I've been, I have, I have tested for COVID now, I think six times or so, and I've tested negative for everything across the board. Uh, so at least I've, I've been lucky and I've done a few things right. You know, I try my best to, to stay away always to mask up and, and all that kind of stuff and do a lot of hand washing, but I've been into that for a long time. I mean, listen, just being aware of the way that, that germs spread and right. the, and the, the danger of, of microscopic bacteria and viruses and stuff. That's the kind of thing that, I mean, you know, it was only recently in the last few years when they started to, to, have mandatory like stations, uh, hand sanitizing stations in hospitals, the mortality rate dropped by 80%. Oh, stop. There were people, That's true. Is that 80%? True? Yes. In kidding? some like hospital. Oh, yes, yes. It's, uh, it's amazing what a huge impact it can make just wow. to be conscientious of that kind of thing. Wow. Okay. So now if you have a delivery still, do yeah. you wipe things down? Do you go through all of that? Uh, I don't do the crazy meticulous stuff, but I wash all, all my food when I, you know, it's like all my produce I wash before I eat it. Right. Certainly. I'm still a lunatic. I go out with my green stuff and I spray the yeah. boxes before I bring them because like yeah, stores I, I like- I don't blame you. The stores have had tremendous uh, Costco, Target, you know, where I get my dry goods and stuff. They have tremendous outbreaks of COVID. The employees yeah. all have it the Amazon delivery guys, all of that, they have it. So I figure right. they're touching these boxes. Well, so I'm- You're I'm, absolutely right. I don't right. know if I'm right. I don't know if people really get it that way, but I just know that I'm still crazy that way. It's definitely better to be safe than sorry in this situation, especially because there's still so much that we don't know and there'll continue to be a lot that we don't know. It just is going to take time and observation. And you know, there's no way to predict the future of, of something like this unless you have actual data. So, and we have, don't have enough time with it to have data yet, so. Will you be online to get a vaccine when it's your turn? 
For sure. I'll be definitely ready to rock and roll on that, you know? And I haven't gotten, I just like, you know, for, for a long time now, I don't, I don't get sick very often. I like get a flu or a cold every couple of years or something like that. Uh -huh. And it's usually in and out in, in a day or two, a couple of days or whatever. And, um, and I, I, I haven't done flu shots, but I don't, not because I have a, you know, you know, it's not a, it's not a position I'm taking on it. I just haven't right. I've been like, it's been okay without it uh, for me, but I want to, I want to contribute to public health. I don't, you know, I have no problem getting, getting, certainly getting the COVID vaccine. I would rather not have it. And I'm more importantly, I'd rather not spread it. The thing that everyone is most concerned about is not that they are going to get it, that they're going to unknowingly give it to somebody and cause Absolutely. harm in their life. That's nobody wants that. Have you traveled since COVID? Yeah, I've traveled uh, a few times. I mean, it's funny because it seems like I've hardly done any travel, but by comparison, I've probably done more travel uh, than others. But again, it's been extremely secured and, and, and with how, multiple how so? tests. How so? Uh, well, a lot of like keeping everyone cordoned off. There's like, like you know, we all in our bubble, uh, like, there's, we all get tested regularly and every time there's something we're getting we're getting tested we're very conscientious about it with each other you know right. and not no like a lot of tons of hand washing wearing masks whenever we're going to be in a situation where it can be like you know where it is necessary and uh and i mean you know for me like on the airplane i we, we all have hand sanitizer we're just giving it to each other all the time we got the clorox wipes and wipe everything down on the way um and and just just generally looking out for each other and all being on the same, you know, having the same agenda. And we all know that it's a huge responsibility for each one of us, because if one of us gets COVID or comes up positive for COVID, we basically are ruining this show and this performance. Like we can't, we, we, you know, I, I, we could be there and ready to go and then come up and then it's like the show's canceled possibly. So we're all really just trying our very best not to contribute to that. Has anybody in your bubble or anybody close to you gotten gotten the virus? Yes, I've known a few people who have gotten it. Uh, I've had a few situations where I've been, like where there was a possibility that there could have been some sort of cross over uh, there. But right. I, got, I got, you know, uh, tested many times after all that stuff. And fortunately, Everybody in this house has been negative the, the whole time. Excellent, excellent. Keaton, can you see, can you foresee, like, when do you think you'd be ready to go back on the road and go do that again and go play for real people in real places and stuff? It's, it's such a tough call because it's been, every time anyone's tried to speculate, like within the, the, the community, they've just been wrong. I mean, everything from like way off to who knows, you know? So right. I really, I feel like it's kind of irresponsible to, to guess at all, but we're hoping that, um, you know, at least by next summer, we'll be in, back in the swing, like on the tour bus with Wait, people. Are you talking about 2021 like summer? Like 2021? Like, uh, is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about another it's one? 20, it's January 2020. I never, well, I know when, I know what time of the year it is now. Yeah. But yeah, summer's in a, in a while from now, right? It's like six months yeah. away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're hoping that by, that by then we'll be able to do stuff. But it might not be until, I guess, next, I don't know, maybe fall or something like that. But everybody just, keep, again, I have no idea because people have, have said, oh, it'll be there, it'll be there. But mostly everybody says, we don't really know. So right. we can guess, but it's, it's, it's just a total guess. It's a total guess. I agree. Yeah. Um, before we go further, how about a song? Because yeah, we need some, we need some music. We need to, are, are you going to play us something new or something? I'm gonna play something. I'm gonna play a, 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 a little "When I Go." Maybe. I think that's a good. Idea. How, how, many, that? how, many, yeah. how many hits on YouTube on "When I Go"? On YouTube, I don't know, but on on Spotify, it has over six million now. 
I, it had five mil. I, I it had over five million two years ago when I interviewed you on YouTube. So that's I, amazing. I, yeah, I don't even know. I just checked the Cornell. Uh, nothing compares to you, and it has ninety five million views oh, on, the, on the first one. Wait, before you start to play, yeah, um, yeah. Eric got on here and said that he loves the hey, Cornell bud. story about him running out of a trailer because he was. You know what story I'm talking about? Mm -mm. Uh, he says um, one of oh. Wait a minute. Oh, God. He said that Chris was running out of a trailer on a movie set because he said he had to go do something with you. Um, hang on. Let me see if I can find the story. But I'm slow in this. <laughs> um, I, I Eliza I and I love this know. story about Chris Cornell rushing out of his trailer on the music video set, uh, screaming, I'm 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 taking a Keaton Simons YouTube tour. Do you know? Oh, he was, he was, uh, I don't know. They, it's, it's, it's tough. They sometimes they are, have a hard time explaining themselves. I don't understand <laughs> a lot of stuff that my mom, my mom sends me a lot of written things that I don't really understand what they mean. <laughs> well, that helps. Okay. So I'll bear that in mind. I wasn't, I wasn't there. I wasn't there for that. So I don't know. Okay. I, it's a it's a right. story that didn't happen to me. So it wouldn't be a story I would not be able to tell. I love it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so. Well, when I go. Do you want to give us a little background on the song, like What's how you love? wrote this song? Sorry, hold on. Do you want to give? Okay. There we go. Do you want to give us a little background on the song? What inspired it? Yeah, sure. Really Let's do a little that. background on this swung. Um, this song, of course, I put my hand right in front of the camera. I'm trying to turn it up so I can hear you better. Um, are we good? You can hear me? I can. Beautiful. So this song I wrote uh, years ago uh, with a couple of really, really talented, amazing people who I love. And, and I was writing a lot of stuff then. And of course, Placements are always a big consideration for me because it's been a huge part of what I've done. And I also, I really like creating, there's, there's, you, you, you can create a more diverse music when it's intended for that rather than for the radio, for example. Radio is very narrow in terms of what they're looking for, especially within each specific genre and within the genre that I've mostly released music in. It's it's pretty tough. I don't get you know don't get a chance to do wait, as wait, much. Wait. Stuff. What is your genre, Keaton? Are you alternative? Uh, what is your well, genre? for in for for radio, it would be probably triple. Well, ultimately for mainstream, it would be like hot AC. That's the that's the format. Wait, what you is know? what is that? What is hot, hot AC? AC format is like, um, it's AC stands for adult contemporary. And so oh, hot okay. AC is kind of like young I'm adult so contemporary. Adult. I don't even know that. <laughs> I know it's such, it's, it's funny, right? But anyway, this, this song got a ridiculously cool placement on suits and with no additional promotion or any other help or record label or anything like that, it has been consistently successful and gets a million or more plays on Spotify every year since it's come out. It hasn't slowed down a bit. And I'm so happy. I can't even believe it. I, it's like, it's the closest thing I've had to a hit song. You know? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I hear it. I'd like to hear it, hit go. Put the camera just on you and uh, take it away. Oh, from just a minute. Oh, Oh, on a day that I almost lost my mind, I was feeding this dirty habit of mine. I've been drunk on your life. I was buried alive. I've been so blind. I was tempted by faith and I bear till I break, but I refine. Yeah, you know. And when I go down the road, I'm never coming back. When I go down the road, 
I'm never coming back when I go, time to go. I'm never coming back when I go, time to go. I'm never coming back, no. It deserves every one of those millions of gazillions of hits that it got. Thank you. That's such a fantastic, such a fantastic, wow. Um, Thank you um, so much. Dear, I, we're getting feedback from something. Oh, are we? Is something, I hear echo. Did you leave on the thing that you had turned on to sing through? No, is it on, on now, you mean? No, I put my headphones back on. Okay, I was getting a little bit of an echo. Hopefully, we're fine. okay. It might be. Oh, I think it's okay. Okay, you still good. getting it? Okay. No, I think we're okay now. Um, nice. So somebody just asked that uh, what inspired you to do the cover of "In the Air Tonight," the Genesis song, and said that you oh. them sometime. What was that about? I got asked to do it. It was through a really cool organization and like a community of people that I, that, that was like my extended family who do some festivals, some singer songwriter festivals, kind of offshoot of the rock boat called Rock by the Sea and Right by the Sea where we got a bunch of amazing people together, talented people together. We all co-wrote and recorded a full album in like a week. Wow. And it was amazing and it got released. And then they did a, uh, a all for, you know, charity with, with charitable ties and everything. Uh -huh. And uh, they did one of 80s covers, like 80s synth covers, because Ben Jackson, who produced, produces a lot of the stuff, uh, Brian Facchino and Ben Jackson, two guys who have been like producing a lot of stuff. Ben plays drums and has a ton of cool old 80s synthesizers. And so they create. They he created that track. Those guys created that track and sent it to me, and I just sang over it. And I just happened to sound a lot like Phil Collins. It's like it's spooky. Okay, you can't you can't <laughs> not do give us a taste, or at least a taste. Well, you gotta hear. Yeah, you, yes, of course I will. Let's see if. Uh, I know. I know it's a different. It's a different yeah. thing. I get it. Yeah. But no, the the thing that's cool is the recording is sounds so much like the original. It's like wow, wow. with all those same sounds and everything. Wow. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you told me you were drowning. 
would not lend a hand I've seen your face before my friend But I don't know if you know who I am I was there and I saw what you did I saw it with my own two eyes You can wipe off that grin I know where you've been It's just like I'm not trying to sound like him at all, but I really you just, totally I would have to try going, not to. Everybody's saying that could be a hit right now, and you do. You sound just like Phil Collins. That's crazy. Yeah. Do you know Lee Sklar, the bass player? He's been playing with Phil for. Of long. course, I love. Yeah. I know that you're friends with Lee Sklar too. I've gotten to have the the honor of playing with him a few times now, and I love Lee. We've got a we've got a a, a, a Burge photo and everything. I'm in the book. Good, yeah, I think I'm, I, I'm in the book somewhere too. So yeah, of course. Well, the only people who aren't in the book are people who question, but he goes, here, take a picture. They go, why? He goes, see you later. <laughs> you're not, you're not in the book. What, what projects have you done with Lee? When have you played with Lee? Uh, we didn't do anything in the studio. We've done a couple of live, right. live performances for like the, the LA Sheriff's uh, Department and some, you know, a couple of things for the United Nations and things like that. I, I would love to see you guys playing together. I can't even like, yeah, you blow my mind. He is so good. Plus we have uh, uh, Michael De Temple, who is an amazing luthier guitar maker. He, he, uh, he has, you know, his own line of guitars and basses that are incredible. And Lee has one of his P basses. Wow. Yeah. Um, Wow. Um, people are still commenting about how much you sound like Phil Collins. People are freaking out. <laughs> so uh, has, has Lee ever introduced you to Phil? No, I, I've never met Phil in all these years. I hope that Lee's played him your cover of that. I'm going out with Phil. Huh? Have you, do you know Phil? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Otherwise, okay. I'd play it for him. But, but I'm going to, I'm going to. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna ask Lee if he's ever played your cover of that. Play before. it for Lee and let and and understand that this cover is intended to not be like reinventing the song at all. There's no, it's not like you know it really sounds like it's just every yeah. part is played essentially like note for note. And I and that's a great thing if that's your thing to do. Then go for it. But yeah, I'd love for Lee to hear it. But I hope he understands I'm, that. I'm, it's, send, I'm gonna send it to him and I'm gonna tell him that. I'll, I'll well, be that's sure wonderful. I'll, I'll be sure and to just tell him I'm not imp I'm not trying to sound like Phil. Okay, I'm not. <laughs> All right. So now, even though we're we're in your career, we're talking about that. I want to dial it back because a lot of people yeah. on here today don't know about your history. You come from mm -hmm. you, you come from showbiz royalty. Aside from yeah. Eric and Eliza, your grandmother, your grandfather. So yeah. Okay. So Lila, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I know. I know. Um, okay. So let's talk. Your grandmother was like a maverick, a pioneer. Right. Oh yes, indeed, indeed. She was an absolute. Don't know about Lila. Uh, well, she was. Uh, she was awarded one of the fifty most influential women in television by the Museum of Television and Radio. Wow. Uh, that was probably fifteen years ago or so. And I remember Tracy Ullman is the one who who gave. She was. She was on the. Uh, you know, she was another one that was on there too. We all love Tracy Ullman. Um, and. God, what else? I mean, she was a part of, of sitcom television and just the history of television from the from the beginning, practically, from the 50s uh, on, basically. From a time when women were not in the writer's room. Without a doubt. Right? She was in the, uh, she was directing, she was producing, she was writing, and I'm pretty sure she's the first uh, female to win an Emmy for writing, producing, and directing uh, wow. TV movie and things like that. So really, really cool stuff. Such a pioneer. Her mother was was a pioneer also. She was she passed the bar 
uh, exam. She was a lawyer and didn't end up practicing, but but studied and passed the bar. And that was, you know, she was probably it was it would have been the the twenties, the mid, the early twenties when she passed the bar. Wow. Yeah. Okay, and then your grandfather also uh, made her. Yes, my grandfather, um, my mom's biological dad, David Rayfield, was a screenwriter, and he wrote some of the greatest movies ever. Three Days of the Condor, right? Three Days of the Condor? He He wrote Three Days of the Condor, he wrote Out of Africa, um, The Way We Were, and that, and that. Unbelievable. And that movie is super autobiographical, so that's the, that's like, you know, about him and my grandma and my mom. You know, I did not know yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. I, I have to watch it again that wow. Yeah, I did that, not know that. Um and then and then you also have a step grandfather also yes, and then, yes, um who passed recently, Don Garrett, who was a publicist, but he started off writing, uh he and my grandmother would write. All of her all of her dudes were were co-writers, even if they like most of them didn't even come from that background. There was one of the her ex-husbands that was like a swimmer, an Olympic swimmer, but then he ended up writing sitcoms with her, right? You know, like and and uh and Don ended up in in publicity. He was the publicist for like Jackson Five and and the Flintstones and the Jetsons wow. and stuff wow. like that. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Okay, and so Eliza and Eric were with us last week, but I, I, I don't assume right. that everybody that's here tonight was was here then. So your yes. mom, uh, um, uh, Eliza and Eric Roberts, uh, and your mother had a, has had a huge career, much bigger than one. Yeah. Okay, so when you're, li- you're little. Yeah. And I know you had kind of an interesting thing in your teens, but... So when yeah. you're really little, what, what's your, what's your life like when you're really little? What's going on? Um, well, I was I spent a lot of time, you know, kind of on sets and stuff, and 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 wait, hanging oh, wait, out your around. Father. Those lots. Your father, yeah, also yeah, a huge yeah, career. yeah. Tell us about your dad. Of course, yes, my dad. My dad produced Malcolm in the Middle and uh, Santa Clarita Diet more recently, which is a landmark that's that was the first netflix original show look what they started they sure wow. they sure went they sure went overboard with that after that one they're like all right we'll just only do this now every single day every second of every day for the rest of our lives um so yeah i, I mean my dad is amazing my my mom and dad met uh on a show called way out games and my mom was like producing it at such a young age and she hired him to be a, a like a runner essentially at the time he started right right from the bottom and uh, worked his way way all the way up to the top and is one of the greatest producers you know of, and also an extraordinary director whenever he's had the opportunities directed some of the best malcolm episodes and uh he did a show called brooklyn bridge back in the day which was gary david goldberg's show that was like his life story show and uh and some of those there were some episodes of that show that my dad directed which was incredible gorgeous you know yeah you are totally in showbiz royalty this is so crazy so it's that yeah so when you were born, what what stage of of your what what stage of career were your parents when you were little? They, my dad was an AD. He was an assistant director, and my uh, mostly film, but also TV. He ended up uh, just focusing on television because he wanted to be in town. He didn't want to be on, you know, on the road so much. He'd be gone right. sometimes for months at a time, and and he wanted to be closer to us. Uh, so and uh, so that's what he was doing. My mom was. Acting still, but but uh, casting, right? Then. So mostly casting, and uh, and Lila was doing. You know, Lila was running shows. Like, Give me a break, and all that. That was on at that. You know, Three's Company. Give me a break. Sanford and Sons. All the family. It was all the stuff that uh, Lila and and Mort Lachman, who was her partner. Uh, at the time and was like my uh, that was that was the guy who was in the in the married to my grandma role at the time when i was when i was born <laughs> How many, there were a lot your grandma had some partner had a- yeah she actually didn't marry she and mort never got married but they had the longest relationship there was something about not getting married that helped with the longevity there uh she got married i think five times four or five times okay. and yeah she had to, she would say she was like 
You had to get married back then. Otherwise, nobody would let you have sex. They, they, they would, you know, they'd shun you. <laughs> it's like, I want, you go, all right, whatever you got to do, we'll do this, get everybody to shut up, you know? And she was a huge, <laughs> huge fan of yours. I know she would show up at she your- She was a major fan of mine, a real, like a real soccer hooligan of a fan. She would, she would kick people and trample them to get in. <laughs> knock them down and tell them to be quiet. It was so, great. And so you got to spend time as a little kid, you would get to go on sets and do all of that? Uh, yeah, I spent a ton of time uh, on those sets and also just kind of in the casting office. That was something that I saw a lot of the process uh, of for my whole life. And the thing that's cool is I got to see it from my, with my mom as a casting director. And she's, she's a casting director, like, like no other that I've met because she's, she's an actor. So she right. understands the, the thing that sucks about most casting, uh, most uh, auditioning experiences that you're reading with somebody who's a terrible actor. So you essentially, even if you're good, it's right. not showing what, it's not showing anything. You got lucky. It's setting you up for failure. But when my mom would go in there, it'd be like a breath of fresh air for people. You get to really see the best side of them and a nice accurate representation of what it might be to see them act instead of just watch them terrified and trying to recite things that they memorized moments earlier. That is a huge part of it. That's that's a really yeah. good part. Somebody's asking, how did, did, where'd your name come from? Where did you get your name? Uh, a a uh, Buster Keaton film festival Definitely. that was showing at my mom at my mom was working as an usher at a at a movie theater when she was sixteen and she just dug the name and was like my firstborn's gonna be named Keaton I'm so glad that she chose that name too because it really is cool like I I've always I've always loved my name I I, I identify more with my name than I even should like, what's in a name right but like. Uh, but I really do, even when I was a little kid, we would all like play make-believe and everyone would come up with this pseudonym and I was always just Keaton. I couldn't, <laughs> I, would, I never wanted to be named anything else. <laughs> I love that. Not so a lot funny. of people like their names, let alone love No, them. I love it. You're the only Keaton I've ever met and that's a great thing, uh, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's unusual. So it's nice yeah. to be one of a kind. Um, Absolutely. I know a couple so of nice Keatons. I met one, the first other Keaton that I met, uh, most other Keatons I know are female, first, firstly, which ah. I think is amazing. And the first Keaton I met uh, that wasn't me <laughs> was an infant baby girl. And I was on tour and I had all my gear that had my name stenciled on the side of it and stuff. And this mom with her baby came up to me at an airport and said, is your name Keaton? Is that you? And I'm like, yeah, she said, that's my daughter's name. And I said, well, this is amazing. This is my first Keaton. <laughs> it wasn't the last, but it was that was my first Keaton. <laughs> first Keaton. That, that, that kid, that baby is probably at least 16 now, I'd say. Wow, I love it. So you've also had like some unusual people around in your life because of uh, your family. Yep. Like you had a very interesting babysitter, I heard. I've had, a, I've had a lot of babysitters. My my mom really got behind and championed some great actors that, and we have her in great part to thank for the fact that we know who they are today because she fought long and hard to uh, get people to pay attention to people like George Clooney, David Duchovny, okay, no. Halle Berry. Right <laughs> These people babysat you as far as... Oh, yeah. They, well, of course, they didn't have a pot to piss in. They, had to crash, they were crashing at the house. They, were doing, they didn't have anything to do. They were actors unemployed. You know, they were so, just so hanging George out. George Clooney babysat your ass when you were a kid. Clooney was there. Yeah, Clooney and Duchovny, of course. And he talked okay, about so now wait, I love David very much. Let's talk about David for a minute because you've made yes. music with David. So, yes. so when your relationship with him started, you were just a little kid? Yeah, I was probably only seven or eight when we very first met. And uh -huh. then we, and then a million years later, I was in an episode of uh, Californication. And we stayed, he and my mom have stayed close friends forever. And he was always aware of what I was doing. You can't be friends with my mom and not know what's going on going out with me a little bit at least That's and uh and Wait, then i was on did your Cali. mother discover david uh discover i think she, like you know i don't want to go give give a bunch more credit where credit's due but long story short yes essentially you know she was the well, one actually, who really championed him and said this guy's a star and when and he 
he fought long and hard. He auditioned a lot before he got anything. And his ratio was was not what you'd think it is for somebody who ended up becoming extremely successful in that field. You, you know, know, I wonder if your mother's the one who introduced him to Henry Jaglum, uh, Eliza. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, of course. The of course. Together. And well, yeah. Henry, Henry's the one who actually made gave David his first starring role in a film. Of, of course, so, yeah. yes. So that was probably through a lot. That makes total and sense. Henry, I've been in a few Henry Jaglum movies as well. <laughs> Uh, you know, so who has it? Really? No, I'm kidding. But well, uh, is that who has it? Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So okay, so I love Henry. So <laughs> me too. Okay, so too. you have the okay. So you and so you meet David when you're a kid, and then how do you yeah. end up starting to? How did you get into Californication? How did that happen? It, it was uh, my gosh, I don't, I, I really don't even remember the exact, but I, I auditioned for the role, and when you weren't playing yourself. Doing, I wasn't playing myself. No, I played. I played a real different type of of character from myself. I mean, I'm still a musician with tattoos and blah blah blah, you know. But like, uh, but I was a jerk. I played like a, a like a real asshole. <laughs> I have to go back and find the. I saw every episode, and and Evan Handler is a friend of mine and of the show. Of course, he was on a, a few months ago. Yeah, I, I love, love Evan. Uh, I love everyone involved in that show. Those amazing. they are just so amazing and. I got to play. We, we we shot at the Greek theater, and I did, did a live performance. Me and Marilyn Manson and Tim Minchin. We did like you know, it was really really fun. Uh, and then and then David had started playing guitar a little bit, and he's always been such a huge fan of music and so passionate. And he's one of those many people who have been discouraged from creating music because they don't sound like Whitney Houston or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like. Who cares if you have passion inside of you, you have something to say, and that's how you want to say it. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks at all. And uh, certainly, if you care what I think, I think let's do it. I think let's go for it. So, um, so we did, and we started working together, making a lot of music, hanging out, uh, jamming with, putting together bands and jamming live, and doing all kinds of stuff. And and it was just wonderful, and we, our our relationship was rekindled as as a, an adult now for me. And he's I I really I consider him to be one of the closest friends that I've ever had, and a real like a big brother, you know. And I just I love him and appreciate him so much. He's always been there for me when I need him for anything, and I I hope he knows that I'm always there for him whenever he needs it. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I, hope, I hope we see more of him. I mean, I, I, unless I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm is he doing something? Has he been? He's always doing. He's like James Franco of the of of doing something all the time. He's writing books. He's writing novels. He's doing. I mean, the guy. I honestly, I can't keep up. I, I like to just be surprised and find out. Oh, he's uh, you know he's he's chiseling a shrine to whatever, who knows you know maybe we'll do some David Blaine. He's freezing himself in a block of ice in Times Square. <laughs> I, I, who knows you know. So all right, so Keaton, I remember here. I remember the last time you were with me that you were telling a story about your emancipation when you were a teenager. Tell us. Oh you. yeah, <laughs> my emancipation. I know. Well, my, yes, it wasn't a, uh, it, it wasn't a traditional emancipation. It was kind of a, an on the fly emancipation, but no, when, I, when I was younger, it was, it was just, a, it was, it was such a weird time. You know, I was around a lot of, of craziness and a lot of drugs and alcohol and people who were young, and, but, but not kids. And I was an actual kid, you know, and, uh, and there was a lot of, there were a lot of lines, blurred lines between what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. You know, I saw a lot of people uh, in really compromised situations and, and, uh, the the effect that that can have on someone who's who you know is is a little child it just can feel very unsafe unpredictable and so i started to to really put a guard up and i and a real like don't don't mess with me attitude i would get to a line you know get to a point where i would just be like i'm done handling this and my behavior might become might cross a line, you know, like I was a teenager already at that point. Now I'm at the point where it's like, I'm not completely at the mercy of, of these people anymore, you know? Right. Uh, and so, and it had gotten 
really just just kind of dangerous and and not and unstable in the house uh and i have gotten into an altercation with with eric and both of us were in compromised positions at the time chemically and emotionally uh and you know when i think back to the ages that both of us were i mean i was what i would consider to be absolutely a child today how, like I how, would, old, uh, how old were you 16 15 i think or 16 and, and you, you punched did you punch him Oh, I did. We had a we yeah. I I, I used uh, I used uh, some some uh, some foreign objects and stuff too. We got in a physical altercation. It was verbal and physical altercation. And yeah. um, but he was. I mean, God, how he he must he couldn't have been he couldn't have been as old as I am now. He must have been like in his mid thirties or something. I mean, I uh -huh. I think of him as he was a kid now, right, you right. know. And and uh, and so. You know, I was in a position where I felt like I had gotten to the end of my rope with dealing with with this unpredictable situation and unpredictable guy. And so I felt like I was taking a stand, fighting back and kind of protecting my family. You know, uh, it's the best I could come up with <laughs> at the time you know uh -huh. and uh and so you know it didn't have the effect that i wanted it to have in the sense that like it wasn't the rest of the family wasn't you know particularly moved by it it didn't inspire them to to do any to change at all so uh -huh. i just took it upon myself to 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 leave and so i split and i that was that was it i've stayed with you know my parents and stuff they've always been there to to support me and been there for me and it's never they would never let me not have a place to right. to live or to stay but right. i i chose at that time to to take off and and that's i pretty much have been, lived on my own since then you know okay but now as i recall yeah you took your little sister with you no, she didn't come with me. She didn't, nobody, nobody would come with me. I thought that you and your sister lived separate from Eliza when you Oh, oh yes, yes, ultimately, yes, that's right, that's right. After, after a few weeks of, uh, of me not lit, having like a place, you know, trying to figure out where I was going to live more permanently, right. you know, uh -huh. as just a teenager who was not employable, I was underage and I, you know, I mean, it was not, it was, it was just a tough thing. So, uh, yeah, we ended up figuring out a situation where my sister and I basically had our own place. <laughs> and, okay. and how old were you guys at the time? Well, I was the same time. I was that age. I was 16. You and know, she was, yeah. she she was, was 14 or 13 or something. Yeah, yeah she was a babe. But it wasn't, I mean, we, we really weren't entirely alone. Uh, it was, but we were, we had way more, it's, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't uh, use that technique <laughs> if I had the opportunity now, but I'm also older now than, than they were at that time. And much more, uh, much more interested in having an understanding of how those things work rather than just trying to make them work and figure it out in the moment and and if we can get it off the plate for now then fine i'm i have a more of an interest in in doing the what what is the long term going to be the the healthiest thing for a situation you know and so, so so what was your relationship with your mother like during that time well, I was I was really pissed off at her at at first, you know, because I felt like I felt a lot like those movies where you are rooting for the person to get away from the bad situation, the abusive person, or whatever it is. And those movies usually don't end with everybody going, "I know it's bad, but I'm still willing to stay," you know. And that's that's that that's does that movie sucks. <laughs> I don't I didn't want to be in that movie. So I just had you know. So I was like I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. But I, how could I understand it at the time? I and I, I I I forced that lack of understanding on myself, and I and I maintained that anger and hostility within myself 
I had to force it. It required effort and it was exhausting and it drained me terribly and in ways that I didn't even realize. And then ultimately, uh, Eric was on Celebrity Rehab uh, so you know, wait, what was, 16 what, how, years later. I was going to say, how many years? Yeah, was 15 or 16 years later. And uh, he was on, on CR and Drew Pinsky, who I love. That's another just really important, amazing person in my life because, you know, he, he, he gets it. He's got a lot of conflicts that he has to resolve all the time. He's, he right. has, he's beholden to a network to get ratings, but he actually cares about people. And those, th 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 those come in direct conflict constantly. When you're, right. when you have a show, it's that he literally has, uh, I'm sure is put in a position every single day where he's trying to be encouraged to exploit people for money and he has to refuse and has to figure out a way to have a strong enough position to, to maintain that at all times. Anyway, his role in my life was really phenomenal. He, he essentially, you know, he pointed out what ended up being such an obvious thing, but it's always the most obvious, it's usually right underneath your nose, but he basically said, what does this look like? What does this situation look like when you allow yourself to look at it from your current point of view, rather than the perspective that you had at the time of an right. angry, hurt, scared, very young person, you know what I mean? Try feeling protective, fight or flight. Now we have, uh, you know, a decade and a half of time away from it. You can Wait, have a more common During approach. that time, was Eric trying to trying to make amends with him? I don't know. I think at some t points he would, but I, I can say that I was completely unreceptive and I would not have been receptive and there would have been no technique and no approach that could have possibly worked. I'm, was, I'm absolutely was, certain of that. With your mom during that? It was the same thing. There was no, it was, I made it really clear that that's not something I was going to be interested in was reconciliation. So and, and I had no problem foregoing or missing out on things. I've never been super like attached to tradition or or any kind of the normalcy of things that people tend to get really attached to. Uh, you know, oh, I don't; those things don't bother me. I don't stand on ceremony. I don't mind missing missing an event, missing a holiday, or whatever because somebody's there that I that I don't want to see. So I was never. I never said like, well, he has to not be here and he has to not be there. I would just say, if he's going to be there, then I won't be. So anywhere you want me, make sure he ain't, you know, and that's it. So did, you, did you see her away from him during that period? Yes, that period? yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And yes. was, was, I saw Lila, her plan. was Lila kind of parenting in a way or? Mm, Lila was not parenting at that time. Lila, Lila was never really... <laughs> Not, never really parenting exactly, but she was very, she tried to be very controlling, you know, uh, that was just her psychology. Um, but parenting was something she never really understood even as a parent. You know, she was, she did a lot better as a grandparent. And when she was really just do, being the grandparent, she did an exceptional job. But when she started to try to overstep those boundaries, and I know, you know, that's been, that's not an uncommon issue. You know, and, and she was an extreme person. So anything you got from her, you got a little bit extra. So you were being financially taken care of, though, correct? Yeah, I was being, yeah, I was being essentially financially taken care of. Yeah, I didn't have, I graduated from high school early. That was my next so I, Right. School, yeah. So I've graduated from high school when I was 16. And then I was just you know, focusing on playing music. Like I, I did stuff that made money, you know, like I would, I started playing music and had a band and would, we would play shows and I'd get paid. I would do various this and that. I would act in stuff and I'd make money for that. I had started doing, uh, you know, I'd done a couple of films already by the time I was like 12 or 13. And so was, was your mother, I, mean, I assume your mother was a catalyst for that happening. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, my whole family was a catalyst for that happening, yeah. for sure, you know, uh, but it was something that I definitely wanted at that time. I was super into it, you know, and I had a lot of fun. Was that your initial, what was the first, did you want, what did you want more at the beginning? Did you want to be an actor or did you want to be a, a musician? What, what was? I, I always wanted to be um, a musician. I, I, I always, like, 
from the artist standpoint and point of view, uh, mm -hmm. only a musician. Like I don't, it's, it's very difficult. It's very rare opportunity for an actor to actually do anything that's worth doing. It almost never happens. I, I, I feel terrible for actors who are trying to have a life that feels fulfilled to them artistically because how on earth is it gonna happen? Most everything is complete garbage and even the good stuff isn't even that great. And if you didn't come up with it, then how are you attached to it? Where, where is your connection to this material? And like, to me, it's essential that I'm the one who created the material. That, that's the whole thing. And like, it's like somebody handing me a bad song to sing in front of nobody, you know, it's just sounds really unfulfilling to me. <laughs> and it, and it was unfulfilling, you know, and the, and the, the real, the most devastating truth, and I hope nobody minds me speaking very frankly and uncensored right now about it, but the real tragic truth is that most actors don't ever act a day in their life. All they ever will do is audition, and that is not acting. It's almost the antithesis of acting. It almost prevents acting from, from happening. To be perfectly honest, it does not a accomplish whatever it sets forth to accomplish. Um, it just gets people in a weird, uncomfortable situation where they end up feeling embarrassed and going home feeling weird and demeaned, you know? It's so strange. It's such a bizarre, ritual that you need to come before somebody and do like for me i'm like if i if somebody doesn't want, know that they want me to do it then i don't want to do it if they're not sure if it could be me or or a hundred other people then let it be one of those hundred other people please i don't if you're not passionate about me then i don't want to be involved like that you know and in in music in the world that i've have been in musically for my entire life. I've only ever worked with anybody because I because there's a mutual love and respect for what we each uniquely bring creatively and personally to the table. You know, it's I've almost never had to audition for something in music because it's gets understood that we're not going to be going around the country auditioning. We're going to be going playing. The only way to know is to play. You know, how, how so, did you end up playing with Snoop Dogg? I played with Snoop. Uh, I met Snoop through Slim Kid Trey from the far side. Mm -hmm. And he was, so, so when I very first started, I was still a teenager and I became musical director for Slim Kid Trey, who the far side at that time in the, in the mid and late nineties was mm -hmm. a humongous hip hop group. One of the greatest hip hop groups of all time. And he was starting his solo project and he asked me to be the musical director and I would be in the, studio with him every day i went and did that i mean i was making money that way for for sure a lot of those things were happening so i mean i guess yes i i'm very fortunate in that i've always felt like like if i needed something to fall back on and of course i as a child i had financial support from my from my parents and and and, and even not as a child but like but i did i guess start making some money from this and that you know i i sang on I sang on the on soundtracks for films. I sang on Diz stuff for Disney. I did. I mean, but when I was eight, I sang on the on the Scrooge soundtrack for Danny Elfman, his first uh, wow. score. And wow. and then I did a Disney Christmas thing in French, where I was singing and speaking in French uh, when I was like nine or ten. And so you know those kinds of things when you get a little bit of residuals. And when you're a kid, what did I need? I didn't really need a lot of money. So pretty, pretty cool right there. So, okay. So how did you, uh, so you mentioned celebrity rehab and you mentioned Dr. Yeah. Drew. How did you and Eric reconcile? Uh, well, so Go the ahead. idea was presented to me for the first time in years because it was very clear that I was not interested, but this was clearly a, a, a different type of situation. You know, this wasn't, you know, oh, come on, you know, can't you blah, blah, blah. This was, this was legit. It was going to be a part of his recovery. It was, you know, it was Drew Pinsky, a real person who I, who, who I trust and respect. Right. And, and, you know, they said they were already going to be using my music on the show and this and that and the other thing. And then they found out about the story and Drew said he wanted to talk to me and basically said, look, I, he, he said it, it would be important enough for 
Eric's recovery alone. And I think that it, it, it's something that will be so beneficial to him as a part of this process. But you, why are you walking around with this pain after all these years? Because he knows, now he knows Eric. He knows, he, you get it, you can get it fast, especially if you're in a psychiatrist's office with somebody. You know what I mean? And so right. he understands. And he, he, so I was like, I'm, for the first time ever, I'm open to it because there's there's a plan you know what i mean there's wait, something wait, before, you, before you go on with this story do you have a drug problem did you have a drug problem oh at the, at that time no at that time i was totally sober but i've done tons of drugs throughout my life on and off but at that time i had been sober for a long time for years at that point already okay, okay. and um and so so well, wait that a was minute wait, did you did you do program when you got sober no, I never did program oh, or so you didn't have to get to the ninth step and make an amends. So that wasn't nope. part of your okay. Oh no, 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 that's never no, I've never done any uh I've never had any assistance or any other programs other than the ideas from my own my own ideas for, okay. for a while. Um uh, but yeah, and and yeah, so that was definitely not a thing where I was compelled, but for any other reason to do that. It just I had learned already from from a really really powerful experience with my dad, uh, where we had been in a fight and then had a moment where where I had a choice whether I could reconcile with him or continue to exhaust myself holding on to a bunch of anger. And I chose to to move on with love and to to and our relationship has been amazing since that moment. That was. Uh, 17 years ago okay well, so, well, so what was the what was the thing that happened how, how did it with me down? and my with me and my dad oh wait you're talking about your dad you're this is me and my dad no this, oh, is, my, this oh, is i my didn't dad. know that you were yeah. estranged from your dad okay well we were well, we weren't really estranged for very long it was just a fight you know it's just like it's just a thing that that happens in in a lot of families but it's a pattern that's happened in my family a bit where you know tension is created and and the decision is like we just need to stay away from each other like not just just be have some time apart and i've seen some positive things come from that and i've seen some negative things come from it it, there's, you know, who knows? You kind of got to do what you got to do. I think it's right. important if somebody feels that they're around uh, an energy that's toxic, then to remove themselves from the situation is the most self-responsible thing that you can do rather than trying to dictate someone else's behavior and choices and so on. But, um, but anyway, so my dad and I had just gotten into a dumb fight, you know, and I was being a jerk holding this grudge against him you know and uh and it hadn't been long maybe a couple of weeks maybe even like a month or two something like that mm -hmm. but certainly nothing compared to i had already been not talking to eric for 10 years at that point you know so right. that was that was nothing um and and it was at nozawa it was at sushi nozawa the the, the best the place that's now sugarfish but nozawa knew me and my dad and he used to listen to my music he and his life i love yeah. that man shout out to nozawa the original the best the greatest part of my recovery in my life my emotional healing in my life nice. nozawa so i'm sitting there eating food i was bringing the i was working on my first record i brought the engineer that we were working with to nozawa for his first time the studio was really close Brought him down there. We're eating. We're talking. My dad walks in. He's working on Malcolm, and they used to. They were in Radford, and they used to. You know, he would do lunch at Nozawa alone all the time. So my dad walks in alone. He sits at the bar, comes over, tries to say hello, introduces himself, um, and I try to cold shoulder him. Meanwhile, I'm thinking about it the whole time, and then I had this epiphany. I had this realization. I was so tired. I was exhausting myself keeping this anger up and i just had this moment of clarity where i said what do you want to do when you stop working so hard when you stop trying to do something and trying to feel a certain way how do you feel when you're not trying to maintain a certain feeling and all i wanted to do was forgive each other hugs kisses this was way before covid and <laughs> we and and just say, let's just make it all okay. And that's what I did. I walked right over to him. I was like, can we just have everything be cool? He's like, I would love nothing more. And we've been able to keep it up for, for 17 years from that point on. So I had that as a great 
uh, role, you know, image in my mind for right. when the opportunity was finally presented again to have a reconciliation with Eric. Now, you know, part of me feels like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a TV thing. It's this kind of can be a very tabloidy type of thing. So I made sure that I'm like, listen, this can't like I'm grew up around cameras. That does nothing for me. I'm not I don't care about that part of this at all. So right. I'm not going to I'm not going to do it having anything to do with that. Like we did like Drew was like, no, 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 ma'am. We I, like I want to talk to you alone first. We're going to talk about it. So the first thing I agreed to was to sit down and have a session with Drew. And then and then after that session, I would decide whether or not I wanted to have another session with Drew and Eric and my mom. Okay. So and and so it was great. We did it step by step. And it was in that original session where it was just me and Drew one on one. I told him everything about, you know, what happened. Of course, they love to sensationalize it. It's not hard to sensationalize. <laughs> it was pretty oh, sensational. Right. It's pretty easy. To uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't too hard. But it was. But again, um, the, and then and then he really he presented that thing to me. He said, "You're." I was 32 or something at the time, and he was like, "You're 32 years old now. You were 16 years old at the time. Of course, that's how you felt then. How do you feel about it? Looking at it now, understanding everyone's limitations, essentially understanding that this, you know, knowing now, knowing what you didn't know then about." personalization, about self-responsibility, about empathy and forgiveness and, and about self-victimization. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care how old I am. If I need to get out of the situation, I'm responsible for that. Like, right. I mean, somebody else has a responsibility for it, but that was that, that, that and a, and a dollar will get you a cup of coffee, you know? Like, so it's seeing it from that point of view and understanding also then seeing some of Eric's side of it and his emotions about it, which I had completely decided to ignore, <laughs> you know, and to the point where I believed that they didn't even exist. So, you know, it was that it was all just a wonderful growing healing process. And we've been super cool from that point on. Like it's, it's, that's, Wasn't it was there, 10 years when, ago. So. When you guys came together, I'm trying to remember, I know I've seen the footage. Yeah. Did you sing to him? What, what happened? That was later on. We did. So after we, after the a really powerful reconciliation, um, we, uh, I, I just became a part of like, you know, I got introduced around to everyone else that was there. Um, became friends with everybody. I had done a lot, you know, I've, I've done a lot of therapy in my life and especially a lot of like just self-responsibility therapy. And, and that's something that when you're dealing with a bunch of struggling, recovering addicts is something that can be very, very powerful. You know, they they need strength and, and they need to be able to, to understand the real implications and not just pawn everything off on somebody else or on their pain or this person did this to me or this is unfair or I did deserve this or my my fantasies don't live up to my realities you know and so I became a, a good vibe on the you know there and so they had me for a lot of family stuff and other sessions and they uh, they asked me to perform one of my songs for everybody at one of the like you know, family day type of things and stuff. And it was just, it was great. We had this amazing organized experience. And, and you know, I've had other experiences with, with reality television after that that have been much more, you know, fabricated and, and well, they, not that they're insincere, they, but... They did Celebrity Wife Swap. Didn't they do Celebrity Wife right, Swap? Right, yeah, they, yeah, they did Celebrity Wife Swap. And I was, I was there... You know, I, I I had like one day of shooting on that or whatever, and they did, I haven't even seen it actually. But um, but like, I don't watch a lot of this stuff. Like usually, if I do something, I'll watch it one time, and then that's that's it. I I like to I want to be doing the next thing, or right. listening back and looking through old photo albums, basically musical photo albums, where I get to listen to myself at 27 and go, oh my god, this child was. You know, it's just incredible. So since that time, you guys have had a fairly extraordinary relationship, actually. Yeah, yeah, totally. 
we've, and we've rocked it. I, I mean, the support that, that they, they're always talking about you on social media and stuff, promoting everything you do. I know. Uh, I know every time I, Eric will talk about you till the cows come home, if given the opportunity. Uh, with great love, with genuine yeah. love. Oh, of Eric. course. Absolutely. And that's something that I knew, you know, that I, I was always suspicious of during the time when we were estranged because, you know, I, I didn't know where that stuff was coming from. I wasn't involved in it, you know, so it's, it was, that was another thing that was really, that really felt good to know that that, that all of that comes from a genuine place and even was even coming from a genuine place when he knew that I wasn't even going to be paying attention to it, you know? <laughs> Right. Sorry about that. We uh, it looked like we got kicked off there, but we didn't. We're still on there. Something we I had a weird interruption. So, and and your relationship with your mother has yeah. has tremendously healed. I assume. Definitely. Um, absolutely. That's been our our relationship has always uh, been just really like deep there's just a lot it's complex you know there's a lot to our relationship we spent so much time trying to have a professional relationship as well as a personal relationship and she what, and I what both, is your mother's role in your career because I thought she was your manager she's not your manager per se no she hasn't she was like by default a couple of times basically but and and then you know, I kind of wanted her to be, but it was really difficult to have her uh, as my manager because unfortunately people, professionals in the industry, especially men, misogynistic <laughs> bullshit, uh, just, you know, the don't, they just, if it's your partner or your family or whatever, they immediately are have a prejudice against that person. And, and it ends up being really unfortunate for me as the artist who that shouldn't be a part of it. Your, your weird bullshit of not being able to, to do business with women should not be, should not trickle down to the artist you're supposed to be representing. You know what I mean? Um, but such is this weird gross business where the whole business is made up essentially of people who who can't do anything so they create a this facade where they pretend that you need them for stuff but then they don't actually do anything um my mom did a lot of stuff she's very proactive you know what i mean she your was always got you a stuff. lot of placements for your music hasn't it, exactly that's what that's been the main thing for my mom and that's been the most uh, successful avenue throughout my career, you know, that and live performing, which that stuff, nobody else can really do that for me. I've never had an agent, like a real uh, booking agent ever. And I've been touring for 25 years, but wow. like, <clears throat> um, you know, and, I, and I've had a couple of managers kind of, but I, I never really, I can't, I can't say that any one of them has actually done anything I I've had that experience right. myself. Mm -hmm. By the way, we have a mutual friend, uh, Ross Hogarth, who says to say hello. To oh, you. my God. I love Ross Hogarth so much. Talk about a talented person. My Lord Almighty. He, we did my live album together. He produced and oh, remixed. I didn't know that. And, oh, yeah. And my oh, God, we my. had such a great time. He took something that was that was not easy to work with and turned it into something that is absolutely wonderful and fun to listen to and that people still dig today. So it's super cool. How about can you play us something from it? From that thing, I mean, I I, I played a live. It was a long live thing. So there's tons of tunes. I got medicine from that one. I've got beautiful play whatever, pain. Whatever. Uh, that's the song. That's the song. That's the one. That's All right, let's do it. That's what I'm let's thinking of. There, oh, there you go. All right. All right. This song, man, I love Ross Ogreth. He just, he just wrote, I love you. Oh, but yeah, my, my mom, like, it's never really been official, you know, like, as a representative. A couple of times for different periods of time where I was just kind of like, look, we know that nobody else is doing anything and let's just make it you and see what we can do. But it's tough. It's, it's there, depending on what you want in this industry, mm -hmm. you, you either have to be in the club or, or you're not in the club, you know, so. Yeah. And 
And I'm already extremely fortunate that I get included in the types of situations and conversations and projects that I've been involved in. Um, I, I can't even believe it sometimes, you know, I like, I feel incredible about that. And it must have been really fun for all those managers who got to say that they represented an artist who did such cool shit when they didn't even do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why's it gotta be so hard? Why's it gotta be this way? It's like I'm being torn apart by all this beautiful pain. I know you wanna be with me, but you gotta go with him. Freedom isn't really free. Before you learn to swim, and I shudder in my sleep. I can hardly close my eyes. Then I wake up in a dream, free now from a life of compromise. Yeah, you never lost, but you never won. Cause you never fought and you never moved on. You never lost, but you never won. Cause you never fought and you never moved on. Don't be afraid of looking back. Oh, oh. Everybody has a past. Now you got my heart racing, used to be the days, and I wanna be patient so this doesn't fade away. So if you're gonna save a life, maybe it should be your own. Cause baby, we don't have much time before we go stumbling home. And I know that we just met, but I'm never understood how can something be that bad when it feels this good and I shudder in my sleep and I can hardly close my eyes and I wake up in a dream see now my life of compromise. Oh, you never lost, but you never won. Cause you never fought and you never moved on. You never lost, but you never won. Cause you never fought and you never moved on. Don't be afraid of looking back. Oh, everybody has a past. Yeah. Now you got my heart racing on sticky days And I want to be patient so this doesn't fade away mm -hmm. No, so this doesn't fade away I say you never lost, but you never won Well, you never lost, but you never won Oh, you never lost, but you never won. Cause you never fought and you never moved on. Don't be afraid of looking back. Oh, 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 oh. everybody has a past. Now you got my heart racing, it used to be days, and I wanna be patient so this doesn't fade. Got my heart racing, it used to be. And I wanna be patient so this doesn't fade away. Mm -hmm. So why's it gotta be so hard? Why's it gotta be this way? It's like I'm being torn apart by all this beautiful pain. Oh, God, mm. you know, that, that what beautiful pain. Of course, that was the song. It's just, it's, it's a perfect song. It's Thank perfect, you, my dear. It's a perfect song, executed perfectly. And by the way, 
I had Thank no you. idea, but I was looking at the comment mm. and Dr. Drew was with us when you were talking about <laughs> Oh my God, I love Drew, my man. Yeah. My beautiful Dr. Drew. So I love you, Drew. I love you, man. Yeah, that's, you know, I was thinking, I don't, I don't mean to, to, to put any like negativity out there and, and down talk people. There's, there are a lot of great people who are representatives within mm -hmm. the industry. It's mm -hmm. just that it's a, it's a vocation that is ripe for, for, for people who, who are willing to take advantage of someone else's hard work and just say, yeah, thank God I was here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like now, you know, give me my money. And it's it's been happening since the beginning of being beginning of time. That's what Socrates and Plato were speaking out against. These sophists who were coming and trying to take people's money to do things for. Them. I'll help you out for a price. You know, it's for me. I as soon as somebody's charging for something, I it's immediately compromised as far as I'm concerned. Like you know, I, part of the reason why I chose music as a as a career path was because. I feel very uncomfortable doing something for money. That's not a motivator for me. It's not a motor you know, motivator, man. I understand it represents other things. And you can do. you yeah. and I talked about this at length last time because this show, Game Changers, yeah. used to be called The Road Taken, Celebrity Roadmaps to Success. And the reason that I started that was because yeah. as an artist myself, I never equated the money with the art. I, I didn't make any really. I just did what I love. And still, I'm still alive every day since the, since the pandemic started. I was doing seven days a week at the beginning mm -hmm. just to be of service. There's, there's no money here. For, but, but I do respect when people Earth. can marry creativity and commerce. And without, without being mercenary, yeah. And you managed to do that very well. I, I, yes, I think so too. That's where that's where I feel really good about. That's why I feel comfortable with this as a career path because truly, I would be doing it anyway. I would be doing it if I never made any money doing it. I find it to be wonderful that people, uh, you know, the 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 patron artist relationship is age old as well because people who enjoy art understand that an artist's work doesn't have intrinsic value. You have to support it. Otherwise, that artist is going to have to do something else and they won't be able to create art. So if you want art, you need to be part of supporting the artists that create it. Um, but the artists that create it ideally can then just focus on being creative and not having to hustle or compromise themselves for, for, for money. Right, right, right. I uh, I love the fact that you would never consider compromising yourself, that you are true to yourself, Absolutely. and yet you've managed to have success. So let's talk about, well, before we get to the latest thing, and it was yeah. so exciting, your first feature film. Um, but oh, yeah. now, Brian Cranston, did he... Did he request a song for Malcolm in the Middle? How did, what happened there? Okay, so Ma so my dad produced Malcolm in the Middle, and uh, and you know my dad is much more tactful about the ways that he promotes me on the shows that he's working on because he knows what people go through in those situations. Okay, so he's it's not like he doesn't talk me up like crazy and is my biggest fan also it's just that you know there, there's I, I think you can catch more flies with honey from time to time and when you're working on right. you know mainstream stuff so anyway everybody became a f fan of mine over the years especially because they weren't pushed to, to do it and to use it you know so that was great right. and, and Brian is was you know that family on Malcolm that whole crew became a family and I didn't spend a tremendous amount of time there, but I spent plenty enough and was really warmly adopted into that family. And it was so cool and just beautiful. And so Brian had this idea. He was directing an episode that was really funny where the kids would got, get caught up in a thing where they're on a billboard, uh, vandalizing this billboard, but it gets misinterpreted and they're making some positive political statements <laughs> they're like all over the news and stuff and i and brian had an idea that i would be a folk singer singing some protest song about the kids who are up on the thing and so i i wrote this tune and i did this thing and i was on it was great give us a little taste of it oh my god i don't i really 
It, I know this. I don't is even remember it. I would have to. I, I seriously don't even okay, remember. Don't it's worry like, about. It. Don't worry about. It. Oh my gosh, I don't. I hardly remember. It. But I. But and I think the only way to hear it is on Malcolm. <laughs> is on that episode of Malcolm in the Middle. But I've got like long, my long hair. So they had already actually used um, currently on uh, on an episode the right. recording and did a sync. A sync deal with me having right. nothing to do with my dad. I mean, he got involved because he was the producer, but the the um, someone who was music working in the music supervision department had become a fan of mine and wanted to use it, and then found out that my dad was the producer. He was working with my dad, Holy but it's shit. great, and that actually is a really good segue to uh, part of how I got. Love weddings and other movie with, we, with, we have to yes, talk about this. Okay, so with Dennis you- Dugan who also has history working with my dad on uh, Moonlighting first. Unbelievable show. Unbelievable. And, then, and then Problem Child, which was Dugan's first feature film. My dad AD'd the movie Problem Child. Okay, who was in, it, I, you know, for those of you who don't know, Bruce Gilbert Willis, Godfrey, yeah. Bruce yeah. Willis was, was, became a thing because of Moonlighting. So, okay. Yes, Moonlighting was Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepherd when, oh. when uh, yeah, exactly. But and, it made Bruce uh, Willis, I mean, it made it him. Made, it totally did. Yeah. Absolutely made Bruce Willis and, and was an incredible, incredible show. But that Problem Child uh, was uh, uh, John Ritter oh. and, um, Gosh, who else? Who played the kid? I, I don't even know. But it was, yeah, you know, it was a goofy, raunchy comedy. And Dugan is known for those really great, you know, like Saving Silverman, Happy Gilmore, Grown Ups, right. Big Daddy. Those are like some some of those movies are just so funny and so iconic. I mean, yeah. there's a song about Dennis Dugan and how awesome he is for directing uh, Saving Silverman and all this stuff, like some really? weird indie. Okay. Oh yeah, it's it's amazing. The 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 the, the verse, the Dugan verse, the Doogie uh-huh. verse is uh, is is wide. But so I love this man. I've known him since I was a kid. Now, yeah. completely said, having no idea. My my dad hasn't worked with Dennis Dugan in thirty something years. Okay, uh-huh. at this at this point. Uh, Michelle Silverman, the greatest music supervisor in in the world, um, she has music souped a bunch of Dugan stuff, most of Dugan stuff. He's making this movie. It's a real passion project. He, it's already been years in the making. Um, he was. It's very music centric. There's a character that that is essentially a. Uh, uh, um, third person narrator via song and stuff like that. But he doesn't write songs. He doesn't know how to play music or how to write songs or anything like that. Right. He wants to work with somebody who's into something like that. And Michelle goes, well, I've got the perfect person for you. Didn't even put it together that that Jimmy is my dad, you know? Oh my God. And then, and then when we put it together, it was just that much that much cooler and that much more like comfort and love. And and But the main thing was, I said to him, like I went over to, to his house, we started talking about stuff. I read the, the script in its current uh, state. We talked about songs. I told him everything I do. And I said to him, I, if, I will do this whole thing if, you, if, you, if you'll let me. You know what I mean? Like I'll score the whole thing. I'll do everything with the music. I'll, I, I want to work really close with you. This is right up my alley, total dream come true. And I don't care how long it takes. I don't care when it starts. It could be 10 years from now. And I'll be like, here we go, let's go. Press the button and I'm there. And we both took that very much to heart because it was it was about four years later. Get out of here. Oh yeah, and I'd gotten a call a couple of times, a couple about once a year maybe, you know, where he'd uh-huh. be like, this might be it. We might be ready to launch. And I'm like, you just say the word, I, nothing has changed on this part, you know, on this side, like I'm ready to go. And then it was perfect timing. I had just like come here, had a regular schedule with tur- touring. So I knew when I was going to be home, when I was going to be off. I was working with my, some of my favorite people in the world. Now I have, I get to see them and work with them every day. I know exactly who I'm going to pull in on it. And everything right. just fell into place beautifully and brilliantly. We wanted L King for this role from the very beginning. And for a while, we didn't know if we were going to be able to get her with scheduling and stuff. And then we ended up getting her and she was incredible. Uh, Diane Keaton and Jeremy Irons, Maggie Grace, 
uh, Diego Boneta, Jesse McCartney. There's so many incredible actors in this in this movie, and it's just it's just great. It's so sweet and dear, and it's really it's it's right before COVID, <laughs> and it's amazing because it's timeless in this way that maybe nothing can ever be again after this, you know, it all has to be taken into consideration, but it's, it's such a beautiful, just breath of fresh air to go. Yeah. A rom-com in the classic, in the most classic sense. Is it streaming? Can we see it? Yes, it is. It's streaming on Amazon and on Apple, like iTunes and all that stuff. And, and you know, numerous different places. The only reason we didn't do a theatrical release was because of COVID restrictions. Of course. Okay, yeah. so you have to play us. So, wait, what? What's the? Was this the first film that you scored? I know it's your first major motion picture. Yeah. Have you scored before? I've done some score work before. Um, th you know, song from but with songs. You know, right. the the very first project that I worked on, the way that I got my first like EP and demo before Maverick and before all that stuff was because I recorded a collection of songs for a movie. Five of my songs were used in this film. And so it was almost like a scoring gig. Well, what what film that, Keith? It's called Mercy Streets, directed by John Gunn. And it was, I mean, the year 2001 or something, 2002, maybe. So <clears throat> a long time ago, maybe even earlier. I mean, God knows, it was, we recorded on tape. We didn't even have Pro Tools. We didn't even record it digitally. It was recorded to tape. So, right. um, so anyway, I, I've, done, I've done a couple of other score gigs, commercial stuff for commercials, a couple of short films, and then another uh, independent film that I scored that was a bunch of recapitulations of the song Beautiful Pain. They ended up actually naming the film Beautiful Pain. Um, and wow. so I did a bunch of different reinterpretations and recapitulations wow. of that song, different styles, different uh, orchestrations and stuff. And, um, and, and But that was it. This is the first time I've done actual score, like real traditional. There's stuff in here that is traditional score, like yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud. I'm proud of us. You know, I think like, I'm just proud of us. And, and Dugan I'm, I'm watching can't it say I'm enough. Watching it. I'm excited. Oh yeah. And he went up to everybody <clears throat> and said, we did this. I did this. I wrote these songs with them. You know what I mean? Like, that's like, it's such a wonderful thing for somebody who's never done that before, but they have a creative vision. They have a creative voice. Obviously he, he's a creative genius to a certain, you know what I mean? Like, so let's see what happens in this medium. You never know what's going to happen. So I, I love working with uh, people who are novice songwriters because I feel like they bring something unique and different and very just of a real innocence and a real honesty and vulnerability that you don't get with more seasoned songwriters who have already written that line a hundred times and have to figure out a new way to say it. You know, but uh, Dugan just says- are, are new, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Are people no, 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 no. Are new at it less fearful of making a mistake so maybe it, it depends i mean there are certain stages you know th th there are people who get so who are just so damn good at it that their confidence level is appropriately high right I, they, they, they don't make a mistake <laughs> they just come up with great right. ideas and that's you know i mean there are people in this town especially who have hundreds of number one hit songs that they've written that's that's right. that's crazy that's just crazy yeah, I've had zero, for example. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, but you know what? It, it, it's timing. is You know, it's like your day is going to come. Yeah. There's no doubt no. about it. Your day is going to come. You're, you're meant to do all this first. You're going to really savor that hit when it comes. It's going to mean. That's totally. I mean, I, I've just seen that stuff so many times. When I think back to my younger self and thinking, this is it. My life is over. Or, it's never going to happen for me. It's this the ship has sailed and all that kind of stuff. I just feel like an idiot now to have ever had that thought once in my life, let alone at like 19 and 20 and thinking right. I better hurry up, <laughs> you know, and make it. Otherwise, this, I'm never gonna have a chance. I really I I don't know. I could this could be the very beginning for me. Who the hell knows? I believe it. I th this new segue into scoring future films. I mean, oh yeah. This guy's well, that's what I want. I want to really be able to open up with that and do things in multiple genres. I've had a, a fantasy for a long time about doing an episodic, like a series. Um, that would be that would be so cool. 
people. You well, know, I pitched that big time when I was at CS Records. Uh, on a network, we got a TV network here, let's do this. Well, you know, when my book gets made into, you know, my book was originally called, Why is Julia Roberts yeah. Living My Life? And, <laughs> and that exactly. is no lie, your mother actually read uh, the, the prologue on the air once. But um, when amazing. it gets made into episodic, Keaton, we'll be talking about uh, the score. We'll be talking. Please. Oh, my God. I would love that. Um, okay, yes. So, so, yes. And I, you know, I, it's funny. I, yeah. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I was just going to shout out Jeff Franklin because he, uh, he gave me an opportunity to score before he did Fuller House. Um, so Jeff Franklin is a guy who created Full House, and then he recently did Fuller House, which is the re right. revamp and the rebrand re of it. And uh, between like a few years before he did Fuller House, he did another sitcom, and I scored it. He asked me to do it. So that was, uh, that was another thing that I did. Um, by the way, Keaton, uh, Snuffy Walden, yeah. do you know who Snuffy Walden is? He, uh, um, okay, yeah. he, he won an Emmy for the West Wing score, so but he yeah. scored television. Oh, of course, of course, of course. And yes, of um, course. yeah, 30 something and a million shows, Roseanne. Anyway, oh, he yeah, said forget, that I should that. get you in touch with him and I will. I'll connect you too. Oh my God, please. I've got to, got to. That would be incredible. That would yeah. be incredible. Okay, so I will connect you two because this that's what So wait, you want to hear something that, that ended up in the movie? Yes, we want to hear something that it so what's it yes. called? What's it called? So the movie the movie is called Love, no. Weddings, and Other Disasters. Right. That we and have. the songs that are so there's a right. So there's a bunch of songs in the movie, and one of my favorite of my new songs called One Two Three Go. Mm -hmm. made it into the movie and so I will sing that one because that is uh, I was so stoked I got to you know I've been composing stuff and creating stuff for a long time and a lot of it is unreleased and I've done that intentionally because I know how many opportunities I get for placements and right. for score and for this and that and I want to be able to say oh I already have that I already have that too you know what I mean? Like, oh, we need this for this scene? Cool, I have a f folder full of, of that vibe and, and it's all unreleased and I did it all 100%, I own it and we can use it, you know? So, One, Two, Three, Go is another one that I was like, let's get this in this movie. <laughs> and I recorded it in Nashville before I ever knew I was gonna move here. These streets, I feel a certain passion. When you're there with me, we start a chain reaction and fall again. Fall again. I'm off my feet, I'm swept away, I'm stranded. Got my heart tethered, the disbelief abandoned the hard way. I learned that hard way. You built a castle out of sticks and bones. Here we go, now get back home and back to life. One, two, three, go after the months of sacrifice. Where did they go? The time to stop and feel alive. One, two, three, go. I know I'm feeling when it's right. One, two, three, go. Out here alone, remember independence. We're gonna bring it all back home and feel that confidence. I love that confidence. Thinking in circles keeps my mind well rounded. Searching for subjects just to stay confounded and trying things. I'm always trying things. You built a castle out of sticks and bones. Here we go. When I get back home, it's back to life. One, two, three, go after the months of sacrifice. Where did they go? The time to stop and feel alive. What do we go? I know a feeling when it's right. What do we go? Where did they go? 
I cannot wait for you to, to see this too. That and that that song is it comes at such a great moment, right? The climax and it's, yeah. It's it's fantastic. You are fantastic. Thank I, you. I, Thank I, you. I've enjoyed this so much. And Me too. I love you and I love talking to you so much. I miss you. I miss you too. And I can't wait until times normalize and you come out to LA and you can come back to the living room. Do you remember Elle? Sure. Elle sure. freaking out. Do you remember you oh, Elle's like Of course, my dear. Yes. Oh, I love her. <laughs> so everybody's like dying for you to come back to the living room. I, you know, I don't have any idea when we're going to be able to do that kind of thing, but of the course. day will come. Yes, the day will come. And maybe we can, um, you know, Brett is starting a festival that is themed that that's that's like his themed festival and it'll be in Palm Desert. So whenever that happens, I'll be close enough to home. Maybe I can take a little drive over to the thing and sing some songs. So and maybe we could take a little drive out to see you with Brett. That would be really that would be great. I would love for you to come and see one of those shows because uh, first of all, we all have such a blast. We love each other. We love every minute that we're standing on stage. And then we all really care. We want it to sound great. We want it to look great. We want everyone's experience to be to be amazing. So we put a lot into it. I, I have no doubt that it's spectacular. You're spectacular. Well, thank you. You're spectacular. And I love you. And I love you, too. And thank you mm -hmm. so much for doing this. And I can't of wait course. for a real hug. And, Definitely. Um, enjoy, uh, and, and yay for... Yay you for being so productive and being so inspiring to all of us to do in kind. Well, thank you. Same, same to you. I was going to say, keep that up. It's amazing. It's so, it takes a lot to, to stick with it and get on and stream every single day or damn near every single day. And I'm so glad that you're doing it because it's, it's, again, it's another way to just, let's make lemonade here, people. We got a lot of lemons. Let's make some lemonade. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love you so much. Thank you so much. I love you. See you, you soon. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining Bye. us. I'm trying to think who's with us next week. Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. But I know, I know, Candy Clark's going to be with us for American Graffiti in two weeks. Wait, I have to see. Nice. Who. Yeah, we've got Candy Clark. We've got um, um, Big Pussy from The Sopranos. Oh, oh come <laughs> on. Sorry. I'm telling you, Gregory Harrison is with us next week. Oh my God, do I love Gregory? Your mom and I do the M word with Greg. <laughs> Fantastic. And Peter Onorati is going to be with us. We're going to have so much fun. And uh, it can't get Your better. guest sermon, I would say. I love you. Mwah, I love you. Bye. Bye-bye.